Uh, so, Bud Warren uh, is a native of the coast and he knows Maine well. Uh, for nearly 40 years, he's led heritage tours of the area for Smithsonian Associates, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, Road Scholar, and other significant groups. I see a lot of people that I know. Uh, Voices of Tidewater Kennebec. That's Ed's title. Um, tonight may be a little different because um, normally I, I'm high, I, I do an awful lot of pictures. And working on the word voices, it's not going to be as highly visual as usual. Listen to the voices. And in fact, I changed things a little bit. <clears throat> so my subtitle, uh, my title is really Early Voices of the Kennebec. And I'll tell you why. It's a few voices, just a few of the many. Uh, I'm teaching a course, I've done it now for three years at the Senior College <clears throat> about the Mar about the history of the Lower Kennebec. I'll let you define that. Um, and what I decided to do this last couple of times is to use instead of Bud Warren talking for two hours and people clapping and going away, I'm giving them things to read about what people who were here said about it and wrote about it. Jay Robbins has been very helpful because he came one day with two big boxes of books or bags of books for me. Uh, but here are the people that I'll mention quickly tonight. <clears throat> and it goes all the way from 1542, or uh, 24, my course does, to 1937. But, but you won't do that. These are people who could have been mentioned tonight, and the next to the last one is somebody you should know, because he's Bodenham, and I do use his book in my class. Okay, so let's call it a few of the early voices. Tonight, I'm going to do this, uh, an overview, and the impressions of some early people who came to the Kennebec described it. You're going to hear them talking about what they saw. Uh, I'm going to talk about the reactions of the natives to the people who came from away. And that gets to be pretty something. And then, just for the fun of it, uh, we'll talk a little bit about a couple of God's guys on the river because some of the missionaries were fantastic. You know, I've gotten to know and fall in love with Father Rail. <clears throat> okay, but the Kennebec. As you know, Kenneth, or, uh, Robert P. Tristram Coffin <clears throat> said it's, a big, it's the river that flowed over the world. It's a big river. From here, it went everywhere. And we went with it. Now, f five nations of the world came here. Two of them struggled to control it and dominate it. And the people in the nation that was here first had it taken away from them. It's a fascinating, convoluted, wonderful, and terrible story. I think that hearing the words that people uttered while they were involved in what they were doing or describing what they've been doing is a way of bringing history alive. It's easier to get close to how people felt when you hear them talking. So open your ears. <clears throat> Come back with me to those thrilling days of yesteryear, as Lone Ranger story said, and listen first to the visitors' impressions. The year is 1524. Now, 1524. 32 years ago, Columbus discovered America. 
27 years ago, John Cabot sailed the Atlantic coast of Lab up to Labrador, setting forever the English claim to North America, and nobody asked the natives. It was just seven years ago that Martin Luther began the Protestant Reformation, and five years ago that Leonardo died. You got the picture? Three years ago, Cortez finished his conquest of Mexico, and just two years ago, Magellan's ship, the last one, completed its circumnavigation. In 1524, Okay. Thank you. Yucca Masala. In 1524, Giovanni Verrazzano, despite his last name, was sailing for the King of France. Sailed across to North Carolina, came north around Cape Cod, across Casco Bay. And he shares with us what he saw at the very mouth of the Kennebec in Phippsburg. I wish I could do this in an Italian accent. <clears throat> the shore, listen, Verrazzano talking in his report. The shore ran eastward <clears throat> at a distance of 50 leagues, keeping more to the north, we found high country full of very dense forests composed of pine, cypress, and similar trees which grow in cold regions. The people were quite different from the others we met, for while the previous ones had been courteous in manner, these were full of crudity and vice, vices, and were so barbarous we could never make any communication with them however many signs we made to them. They were clothed in skins of bear, lynx, sea wolf, and other animals. As far as we could judge from several visits to their houses, we think they live on game, fish, and several fruits that are species of root which the earth produces itself. We saw no sign of cultivation nor would the land be suitable for producing any fruit or grain on account of its sterility. If we wanted to trade with them for some things, they would come to the seashore on some rocks where the breakers were most violent while we remained in the little boat and they sent us what they wanted to give on a rope in a basket, continually shouting us not to approach. They gave us the barter quickly and would take in exchange only knives, hooks for fishing, and sharp metal. None of those glass beads. We found no courtesy in them. Oh, color, color, color. No. We found no courtesy in them. <clears throat> and when we had nothing more to exchange and left them, the men made all signs of scorn and shame that any crude creature could make, such as bearing their buttocks and laughing. <laughs> the, against their wishes, we penetrated two or three leagues inland with 25 armed men, and when we disembarked on the shore, they shot at us with their bows and arrows and uttered loud cries before fleeing into the woods. We didn't find anything of great value in this land except for the vast forests and some hills which could contain some metal. For we saw many natives with paternostri beads of copper in their ears. Let's move on a century. It's 1605. Two years ago, 1603, Queen Elizabeth died, was succeeded by her cousin James IV of Scotland, uniting the two countries. Last summer, Samuel Champlain sailed along the coast from the New Brunswick area down to the Penobscot, returned for a cold winter in St. Croix, and this summer he sailed down here, past the Penobscot, 
to the Kennebec. Listen to what he said about it. Listen. This river, Kennebec, is very dangerous for vessels half a league from its mouth. On account of the small amount of water, great tides, rocks and shoals outside as well as within. Anybody who knows the river knows that. But it has a good channel if it were well marked. The land, so far as I've seen it along the shores of this river, is very poor for the only rocks on all sides. There are a great many small oaks and very little arable land. Fish abound here, as in other rivers that I've mentioned. <clears throat> the people live like those in the neighborhood of our settlement. And they told us that the savages who plant the Indian corn are very far in the interior and that they had given up planting it on the coast on account of the war they had with the others who came and took it away. Iroquois. This is what I've been able to learn about the region, which I think is no better than the others. On the 8th of the month, we set out <clears throat> from the mouth of the river, not being able to because of the fogs. So what else is new? We made that day some four leagues going west, past a bay with many islands, Casco Bay. From here, great mountains are seen to the west, the White Mountains. Okay, two years later, 167. I don't even know if I've got a picture for this. A hundred settlers arrived at the mouth of the Kennebec to establish the first English colony in New England, led by George Popham and Raleigh Gilbert. <clears throat> Some of the group explore the Kennebec as far north as Augusta and maybe further north. <clears throat> Listen to what it was like as described by James Davies who kept a journal. <clears throat> 17 August, <clears throat> Captain Popham in his shallop with 30 others and Captain Gilbert in his ship's boat accompanied with 18 other persons departed <clears throat> early in the morning from their ships and sailed up the river of Sagadahawk for to view this river and also to see where we might <coughs> sorry where we uh, might find the most convenient place for the plantation myself being with Captain Gilbert so we sailed up this river near 14 leagues that's rough, roughly three miles a league up to Mary Meeting Bay maybe We found it to be a most gallant river, very broad and of a good depth. We never had less water than three fathom when we had least. They never came across the bay. They went on. <laughs> An abundance of great fish in it, great fish leaping. There's your sturgeons. On each side of us as we sailed. <clears throat> so the night approaching after a while we refreshed ourselves on the shore in the afternoon we find this river to be very pleasant with many good islands and both large and deep water having many branches in it all five or six coming into here that which we took but beareth itself toward the northeast they probably went up this way. And they explore further up a few days later. Captain Gilbert, accompanied with 19 others and myself, departed to go for the head of the river. We sailed this day, so we, we did the like the 24th until evening. Then we landed there to remain the night. Here we found a gallant champion land and exceeding fertile. Have a good asset point and further up. So here we remained all the night. Next day being Friday early in the morning, we departed from thence 
and sailed about eight leagues farther until we came to an island being low land and flat. And at this island is a great downfall of water, the which runneth by both sides of this island, very swift and shallow. Augusta, maybe? Jay? Yeah. <clears throat> Here, sorry, on one of these islands is a marvelous, uh, there, we found a great store of grapes, exceeding good and sweet, of two sorts, both red. But the one of them is a marvelous deep red. By both the side of this river, the grapes grow in abundance and also very good hops and leeks and garlic. And the goodness of the land, it does so abound, I can't express the same. Here we all went ashore and with a strong rope made fast to our boat and one man entered to guide her against the swift stream. We plucked her up through, through. After we have passed this downfall, we went in our boat again and rowed near a league further. And night being at hand, we stayed here all night. And the first of the night, about 10 o'clock, there came on at the farther side of the river certain savages calling to us in broken English. We answered them. So for this time they departed. The 26th being Saturday, there came a canoe unto us and in, in, in her four savages, those that had spoken to us in the night. His name that came to us is Sebanoa. He makes himself unto us the Lord of the Kennebec. Four years later, another Frenchman, a Jesuit, comes to the Kennebec, <clears throat> explores the deserted Popham Fort, and when wind made it okay, goes up river. Father Pierre Biard. We arrived at Kennebecke, 80 miles from Port Royal, the 28th of October, the day of St. Simon and St. Jude. We do not believe that in six leagues of the surrounding country there's a single acre of good tillable land, the soil being stones and rocks. Now when the third day came, Monsieur Biancor considered the subject in council, decided to take advantage of the wind and go on up the river in order to thoroughly explore it. We'd already advanced three good leagues, nine miles, bath, had dropped anchor in the middle of the river, waiting for the tide. Got to do that. When we suddenly discovered six Armushiqua canoes coming towards us. There were 24 persons there and all warriors. They went through a thousand maneuvers and ceremonies before accosting us and might have been compared to a flock of birds which wanted to go into a hemp field but feared the scarecrow. And when night came, they camped on the other bank of the river, if not out of reach, at least beyond the aim of our cannon. All night there was continual haranguing, singing and dancing, for such is the kind of life these people lead when they're together. <laughs> Now, as we suppose that probably their songs and dances were invocations to the devil to oppose the power of this cursed tyrant, I had our people sing some sacred hymns as Salve, Ave, Maria, Stella, and others. But when they got into the way of singing the spiritual songs, being exhausted, they took up others with which they were familiar. When they came to the end of these, as the French are natural mimics, they began to mimic the singing and dancing of the Mouchiquois, who were on the other bank, succeeding in it so well that the Mouchiquois stopped to listen to them. And then our people stopped 
and the others immediately began to sing again. It was really very comical for you to have said there were two choirs which had a thorough understanding with each other and scarcely could distinguish the real Armushikwa from their imitators. In the morning, we continued our journey upriver. Let's shift gears. <clears throat> 1650. I don't have, I'm, I'm not going to read my, anything from Gabriel Dreyer or Father Rail. That's a whole evening, Ed. I don't know if you can see it. This is the East Coast. This is the St. Lawrence. Look at the maps. Gabriel Drier comes to Norwich Walk, 1646, I guess. He's very close to the governor of uh, Quebec, who is concerned about the Abenaki here, <clears throat> who have been in a lifelong battle with the Iroquois. Gabriel Drier, the French Jesuit, is appointed an ambassador by the governor of Quebec to go down to Boston to try to establish a relationship with the Puritans and the Dutch to make uh, something or other that will buffer the Iroquois who are coming after our Abenaki. Drier goes down to Kushnok, which is uh, at Augusta, meets the factor who's there, who's a Winslow, rel related to, uh, uh, first name I forgot, Jay, uh, down big, big man Winslow down in the Boston area. The Pilgrim. The Pilgrim. And he and Drier establish a great friendship. Winslow, the Puritan, takes him to Boston where he meets the leaders of the Bay Colony and the Plymouth Colony. The leader of the Bay Colony, knowing that it's Friday, has a big dinner with fish. Nice touch. <coughs> nice touch. And then, of course, there's Sebastian Rail, who's the bad guy, as taught around here. He came in 1694, wonderful book, Mary Calvert, Black Robe on the Kennebec. This guy was a real pastor. He was also a thorn in the side of the English, because he felt the English were taking land they shouldn't have. <coughs> he does describe, and I did not bring it, I should have, he describes how when they go to the seashore in the summertime, he takes some certain vessels from the, the chapel in Norwich Walk and they build a little church wigwam and have their services there. Okay. He was a scholar did a dictionary, 500 page dictionary of the Abenaki language. It's at Harvard. That's because in 1622 the place was attacked. He was, had, was not there or had been driven off and uh, they got that and some papers. And eventually went back in 1724 and he was murdered along with a whole lot of natives in his parish. Samuel Penn Hallow writes, it was the greatest victory we have obtained in three or four last wars. Greatest victory. What's the old Chinese curse? May you live in interesting times and places. Fast forward 40 years or so to 1765. John Adams, <clears throat> young lawyer. Abigail's going to present him with a child in August, I guess. 
crosses the Kennebec at the Chops and proceeds to Poundleboro Courthouse in Dresden. You all know that. And I can't, I, I read this once and I can't find it, so I, I'll, supposedly he was not at ease with the rowboat that was going to take him across the chops. And he insisted that the ferryman go get another oarsman so there would be two. If anybody finds that, let me know. But here's what he writes later. Listen to one of our presidents talking about coming to Maine. In the spring of 1765, Major Noble of Boston had an action at Palomar on Kennebec. Mr. Thatcher, who'd been his counsel, recommended him to me. I engaged in his cause and undertook the journey. I was taken ill on the road, had a very unpleasant excursion. It's unnecessary to enlarge upon the fatigue and disgust of this journey. It was the only time in my life when I really suffered for want of provisions. From Falmouth, now Portland, from Falmouth in Casco Bay to Punnelboro, there was an entire wilderness, except North Yarmouth, New Brunswick, and Long Reach, Bath at each of which places were a few houses. In general, it was a wilderness encumbered with the greatest number of trees of the largest size, the tallest height I've ever seen. So great a weight of wood and timber has never fallen my way. Birches, beeches, a few oaks, and all the varieties of fir and pines, hemlock, spruce, I once asked Judge Cushing his opinion of their height upon an average. He said, a hundred feet. I believe his estimation was not exaggerated. A hemlock had been blown down across the road. They had cut out a log as long as the road was wide. I measured the butt at the road and found it seven feet in diameter. 21 feet in circumference. We measured 90 feet from the road to the first limb. The branches at the top were thick. We could measure no farther, but estimated the top to be about 15 feet from the butt at the road to the root. We did not measure, but the tree must have been at the hole at least 120 feet. The roads where a wheel had never rolled from the creation were miry and foundrous, encumbered with long sloughs of water. The stumps of the trees which had been cut to make the road all remaining fresh and the roots crossing the path, some above ground, some beneath, so that my horse's feet would frequently get between the roots and he'd flounce and blunder in danger of breaking his own limbs as well as mine. This whole country, then so rough, is now beautifully cultivated. Handsome houses, orchards, fields of grain and grass, and roads as fine as any except the turnpikes in the state. I reached Pannellboro alive and gained my cause, much to the satisfaction of my client. Here are a couple of descriptions about what the area was like. They're describing our area. <clears throat> Jonathan Hyde, 1792, writes this in 1800 and something. He was uh, grandfather of the man who started the ironworks. In 1792, all below Bath and the river, the seaboard, the islands were all covered with trees. Seguin, Seguin was like a dark forest standing high in the ocean. When we first approached it from the sea, it being a little hollow in the middle, always appeared like a great saddle. Wood Island was thickly covered, but there's not a tree remaining on it now in the same of Stage and Pond Island, 1884. There were but few houses along the river. 
They were scattered in little green openings. You could see a good many single deck schooners and sloops passing up and down, deeply loaded with lumber. <clears throat> Bath did not appear much like a village. A few stores and very few houses near the river and a few houses scattered in the country road, which is now High Street. No roads between <clears throat> that road and the river, chiefly pasture. The appearance of along the main river above Bath and also on the Eastern River was quite interesting. A few farms having been cleared, mills and vessels building, several villages were beginning to grow. And then on the eastern bank was the Poundleboro Courthouse. It was the seat of justice for this region of the country. And a 12-year-old, the same year, William Allen, comes in with his family. He writes this later. He writes about the dangers of getting into the Kennebec and the tedium of making it up river. And listen to what he says about the roads going to Hallowell. <clears throat> Saturday, September 15th, was stormy and the wind so near ahead we made little progress that day and the night following. I don't know how many of you have worked your way into the Kennebec. On Sunday morning, we made Seguin directly in the wind's eye, but could make our course no nearer than Harpswell. He's coming up from Massachusetts. We therefore run into Harpswell Bay before noon and commenced beating along the shore for the Kennebec till after dark, when a violent northeast storm set in, a fine gale, a line gale. When we'd reached within a mile of the river, we anchored in a dangerous place near the shore of Cape Small Point. <clears throat> where the swell of the sea was frightful. Been there? An anchor watch was set with directions if the cable parted to make sail and keep off the rocks if possible. Well, the anchor made fast and the violence of the storm abating as the daylight appeared, we joyfully made sail, entered the river and proceeded as far as Jones Eddy. <coughs> On Monday, the wind being ahead, we could no go go no further that day. Some of us went on shore and visited the old fort at Arousic. We saw around the windows the marks of the bullets shot at the fort by Indians in old times and examined the ancient inscriptions in the gravestones in the cemetery, Newtown. <clears throat> We spent the night at Jones Eddy, thankful that our sloop had escaped the dangers of the sea and that we could rest securely. <clears throat> Tuesday, September 18th, wind still ahead. But when the tide favored by beating and towing with the boat, we reached Bath before noon. I went up into the town and saw a company of boys in uniform go through a military drill, which was quite new sport to me. My father went to Colonel Sewell's to bought a hundred pounds of hay for our stock and bargained for some land. <clears throat> Wednesday we beat up to Lovejoy's Narrows, north end of Swan Island. Then we landed our horse on a projecting rock. My mother took her child in her arms and started for Dr. Tupper's in Dresden, five miles up. Mrs. Tupper being a relative and early friend of my mother. We proceeded but a short distance when the horse stepped out of the path in quest of water, sank into his middle, and threw us all headlong into the mud. The child was covered with mire and almost suffocated, but no bones were broken. I succeeded in getting the horse into the road. We, we all remounted and arrived at the doctor's about dark. We remained in Dresden for five days, and then we rode in a on a poor blind road to Hallowell. <clears throat> the horse refused to go into a ferry boat, and they had to plunge him into the river by main force and tow him across. After a long time, we arrived at Hallowell. Only two or three stores, as many houses in the village of Hallowell, we 
packed up and waiting for a team and they load stuff and end up going up to Farmington where they have a stake. So what you've got is a feeling at least about what the area was like. What about the people who lived here? <clears throat> Listen to them. How do you capture the voices of the native peoples whose lands were being infested <clears throat> with settlers from away? <clears throat> there were many conferences between natives and Europeans who came to the Kennebec shores. We're fortunate that settlers recorded transcripts of some of the most important conferences between them, them and officials from Boston. These are available today. They're written words written by uh, an Englishman about what a native said, so you've got to filter it. <clears throat> but the words on paper, translated by their pens, their spirit comes through in spades. Listen to they felt, how they felt about our coming. Listen to how they feel and imagine how their descendants feel today, two or three days after Columbus Day. <clears throat> Taranaguegas was an orator of the Sagamores on the Kennebec. He's, at one point he's telling one of the people, we should, re <clears throat> we should rejoice that all the English that dwell in the eastern parts, if they return to their settlements, Another time, <clears throat> they get word that because of the Treaty of Utrecht, France has given up its land, it's back to England. Here's a native reacting to that. Well, as to rest of what you say, the Frenchman has given you Plaisance, Port Royal, which is near here and all the adjacent lands. He shall give you what he will. For myself, I have my land, which the Great Spirit gave me to live on. I've given it to no one. I will never give it. I will defend it to the death. And as long as there remains one child of my nation, he will fight to preserve it. Seventeen seventeen was a major conference at Arousic. <clears throat> I'm going to try to play two roles here. I'm going to be Waruna, who is the native orator for that part of the conference, and I'll play Governor Shute from Boston. <clears throat> Waruna starts. We should be glad to see the English settling their ancient plantations and should never be disturbed. Other governors have said to us that we are under no government but our own. Governor, how is that? We pray leave to speak out. Your Excellency says we must be obedient to King George, which we shall, if we like the offers made us. They must be obedient to King George, <clears throat> and all offers and usage shall be given them. Waruna. We will be very obedient to the king if we are not molested in the improvement of our lands. Governor says they shall not be interrupted in the improvement of their lands and the English must not be molested in theirs. <clears throat> Waruna says we're pleased with the liberty your excellency gives us of making mention of any wrong we have suffered. The governor says they must desist from any pretension to lands which the English own. Mm -hmm. uh, this, Waruna, this place was 
formally settled and is now settling at our request. And that we now return thanks that the English are coming to settle here and we'll embrace them in our bosoms that come to settle on our lands. They must not call it their lands. For the English have bought it of them and their ancestors. We pray leave to proceed in our answer and talk this matter afterward. We desire that no further settlements be made. We shan't be able to hold them all in our bosoms and to take care to settle them, shelter them, if it be like to be bad weather or mischief is threatened. They must not call it their land. At the conference, Governor, Governor, um, Governor Shute introduces Joseph Baxter, who's a minister, Puritan minister from Boston, telling them he's the man who's here to be there for their instruction and so forth. <clears throat> Waruna's respo response to this says, as to ministers instructing us, <clears throat> all people have a love for their ministers. And it would be strange if we should not lo love them that come from God. And as to the Bibles, Your Excellency mentioned, we desire to be excused from that point. God has given us teaching already. The French, the Catholic. And if we should go from that, we would displease God. We're not capable to make any judgment about religion. Tell them they must be sensible and satisfied that the English own this land and have deeds that show and set forth their purchase from their ancestors. And we will not be molested in the improvement of them. And they shall not be molested in the improvement of the lands that belong to them. Waruna responds, we desire time to consult. Let us have a... So they leave and come back. They shall have time, but tell them I expect to see them at 3 o'clock with a positive answer. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I, sh I shouldn't have done that. <clears throat> 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Waruna comes back and says, <clears throat> we are willing to cut off our lands as far as the mills and the coasts to Pemaquid. The mills being at Dublin Point at Spinney's Mill, which was built in 1716-17. Uh, Tell them we desire only what is our own, says the governor, and that we will have. We will not wrong them, but what is our own we will be masters of. We can't understand how our lands have been purchased. What has been alienated or what has been given has been given by gift. What he was talking about was Kushnak. Augusta, there was a trading post there that was brought up. Okay, said the natives, we'd love to have a trading post up here. To the English it was... That's our land. <clears throat> Here's an interesting one. The native response to a later a request that they, the natives, remain neutral in case there's trouble between the French and the English. <clears throat> Great captain, you tell us not to join ourselves with the Frenchman in case you declare war on him. Know you that the Frenchman is my brother. We have the same prayer, he and I. We're in the same wigwam with two fires. 
He has one fire, and I have another. <clears throat> if I see you enter the wigwam on the side of the fire where my brother the Frenchman is seated, I watch you from my mat where I am seated by the other fire. I perceive that you carry a hatchet. And I shall think, what does the Englishman intend to do with that hatchet? Then I stand up on my, hat, on my mat to behold what he will do. If he raised the hatchet to strike my brother, the Frenchman, I take my own and run to the Englishman to strike him. Could I see my brother struck in my wigwam and I remain quiet on my mat? No, no, no. I love my brother too well not to defend him. Therefore, I say to you, great captain, do nothing to my brother, and I shall do nothing to you. Remain quiet on your mat, and I shall remain at rest on mine. The absolute best is this, which was a 1721 letter <coughs> that was prepared <coughs> but given by the natives to Penhallow down at the garrison at Arousek. Listen to the feeling behind these words. Great chief of the English, you see by the peace treaty of which I send you a copy, you must live peaceably with me. Is it to live in peace with me to take my land against my wishes? My land that I have received from God alone and my land of which no king nor any foreign power can or could dispose of in spite of that which you have nevertheless done for several years in establishing and fortifying yourself against my will on the Androscoggin and the Kennebec and here. I've been surprised to see a fort, which we, they tell me is built by your orders. Consider, great chief, that I have often told you to retire from my land, and I repeat it to you now for the last time. My land is not yours, neither by right of conquest, nor by gift, or by purchase. I await then your reply within three Sundays. If within this time you do not write me that you are retiring from my land, I shall not tell you again to withdraw, and I shall believe that you want to make yourself master of it in spite of me. As for the rest, this here is not the word of four or five Indians by whom your presence, your lies, and your tricks you can easily make fall in with your sentiments. This is the word of the Abenaki nation spread over the continent and in Canada and of the other Christian nations, their allies, who all together summon you to retire from the land and of the Abenakis that you wish to usurp unjustly. If some particular Indians addicted to strong drink at your behest tell you to settle where you settle at other times, know that all the nation disavows this permission. And I shall come burn these houses after pillaging them. By what right do you do this? Unless you remove from Merry Meeting Bay in three weeks we will kill them all, destroy their cattle, and burn their houses. You Englishmen have taken away the lands which the great God has given to our fathers and to us. Whew. 21, 1721. 1766, just to finish up quickly. <clears throat> Dresden, a young fellow from Boston, Boston area. 
he was a uh, he was a farmer's son kind of bookish somebody maybe a minister or a teacher or something like that supported him he goes to Harvard he graduates from Harvard last in his class oh they didn't figure I mean Harvard was Harvard you don't figure class rank by grade average it's socially he's a farmer's son he goes to teach in a couple of places, Gloucester, New Hampshire, somewhere else, <clears throat> and then decides he wants to come back as a missionary, come, wants to come to the area as a missionary, but as an Anglican missionary. He had gotten to know the guy who was the bishop or the head of the king's chapel. <clears throat> he goes around and gets some letters of recommendation in the Boston area and goes to Harvard and asks the President Appleton of Harvard for a recommendation. No. He goes to London, meets the Archbishop of Canterbury, wonderful little scene. Archbishop is drooling, quite old and shaky and stuff. But he comes back and goes to Dresden, is there from 1918, uh, 1764, I think, or something like that until 78. <clears throat> he writes this about the Indians. There are a great number of Indians frequent this neighborhood. They're the remains of the ancient Norwich tribe and they lead a rambling life. They support themselves entirely by hunting and are very savage in their dress and manners, have a language of their own, but universally speak French and profess the Romish religion. Visit Canada twice a year for absolution. They, great ha they have a great aversion to the English nation, chiefly owing to the influence of Roman Catholic missionaries. And he describes the people who were here. Think about the common people. Maybe Scots-Irish, others settling the area. <clears throat> the people, this is him talking, the people were thinly settled along the banks of the rivers in a country which afforded a rugged and disagreeable prospect. They were in general so poor, not to say idle, that their families almost suffered for necessary food and clothing. They lived in miserable huts which they scarce afforded them shelter from the inclemency of the weather in a rigorous climate. And their lodgings were rather worse than food clothing or habitation. I might here add many affecting instances of their extreme poverty that multitudes of children are obliged to go barefoot through the whole winter with hardly clothes to cover their nakedness that half the houses are without chimneys that many people had no other beds than a heap of straw and whole families had scarce anything to subsist on for months together except potatoes roasted in the ashes. <clears throat> well, time goes on, 1774, 5, 6, 7. <clears throat> as an Anglican, as a loyal subject of King George, he begins to have difficulty in the community. This community that generally, as many frontier communities did, resisted central authority and growing in revolutionary zeal, they make it tough for him. After all, one thing in the prayer book, there's a prayer for the king. Whoops. Another thing, my Presbyterian neighbors, he writes, my Presbyterian neighbors were so zealous for the good of their country, they killed seven of my sheep out of twelve and shot a fine heifer as she was feeding in my pasture. And my necessities were so great the following winter, I was obliged to dispose of the remainder of my cattle except one, one cow. He's off on a parish kind of visit, being afterwards at a settlement about 50 miles from my own habitation at the request of the people to preach and baptize their children. I was assaulted by a violent mob armed with clubs, axes, and other weapons. 
They stripped me naked in search of papers pretending I had conceived the design of escaping to Quebec. And on October 25th, 1777, he's hauled before the local committee for not reading the Declaration, for not reading the Declaration of Independence from the pulpit. There's a wonderful book, The Man Who Said No, Jacob Bailey. And also for preaching a seditious sermon. Oh, I won't go into it, but basically the text for the day with Nebuchadnezzar or somebody else had some phrases that the local rebellious guys translated as a comment against uh, the rebellion. It was to also the locals wanted to put up a liberty pole, naturally right in front of the church. It was determined that a liberty pole should be raised before my church door to affront the parson and express their defiance of the king. But they moved it. And some days before, uh, somebody had given them a barrel of rum to elevate their spirits in this glorious occasion, he writes. Captain Lovejoy insisted upon my being sent for to consecrate the pole by prayer. If I refused, it was proposed that I should be whipped around it. But the motion was lost by a majority of two. It got worse. So bad, he ended up going to Boston, got permission to go to Nova Scotia. <clears throat> he and his wife did and left two kids in the cemetery there. He was a writer. He wrote a uh, satire about mob violence later. He writes a long 34 stanza poem, Farewell to the Kennebec. I won't read all of it. It's awful. <laughs> I'll just read a little. Adieu, ye fair domestic scenes of balmy sweets and flowery greens and yond aspiring grove. Farewell, ye smiling, cheerful seats, ye solitary calm retreats of innocence and love. No more your gentle beauties rise, no longer to my wishing eyes, their pleasing charms in part. Since doomed in foreign lands to roam far distance from my much loved home with anguish at my heart. Ye lofty pines that tower on high, that wave and threaten in the sky to wintry storms descend. And while the winds tremendous war and all the rage of hostile power before the tempest bend. Two stanzas left. I feel, I feel a thousand anxious fears and oft bewail in silent tears my friend's unhappy fate. Involved in scenes of deep distress, exposed, despiring of success to Whig's revengeful fate. Once more, with heavy parting sighs, we roll around our misty eyes. My partner, wife, calls to mind her babes beneath the heaving ground and mourns and weeps with grief profound to leave their dust behind. Voices on the Kennebec. Wow. Quite a story. Thank you.